Hi there, welcome to the new video. Today we'll be going through this very interesting paper which is titled as Note to WEC, Scalable Feature Learning for Networks. It's from authors from Stanford University. So this paper is also one of the early works in the domain of machine learning with graphs. Just as one of the papers I have explained earlier which was titled as Deep Walk that uses random walks to generate embeddings for every node in that graph. This work Node to WEC uses a similar idea of generating node embeddings in a graph using random walks. So the main contribution this paper adds over deep walk is by introducing a controllable factor to how do you generate random walks. So they talk about introducing a search strategy that does a trade-off between how deep do you want to go in a graph while doing your random walk or if you want to sample just from the neighbors. Okay, so we'll see to all of this in little detail. So let's start with the abstract first. We propose Node to WIC, an algorithmic framework for learning continuous feature representation of nodes in a network. In node to wic we learn a mapping of nodes to a low dimensional space of features that maximizes the likelihood of preserving networks neighborhoods of nodes. Okay, so let's say you have a network that has five nodes in this and those are connected in some format. So node to wic learns a dense representation for every node in the network. Let's consider this representation to be let's say 100 dimensions. Now when you try to plot every node of this network in a 100 dimension space let's say or maybe let's say just 2 dimension space after you applied PC or TSNE so the nodes that are near to each other in that space will also be near in the actual structural formation. So this is what node wake tries to preserve that's what they have written. We try to maximize the likelihood of preserving node network neighborhoods even if you represent them in some low dimensional space. So yeah. Our algorithm generalizes prior work which is fixed on rigid notation of network neighborhoods and we argue that the added flexibility in exploring neighborhood is the key for learning rich representations. So yeah, as I already discussed, the way deep walk would work, at every node it would give equal probability to how it would propagate to the next node and that we would essentially sample multiple random walks from every node and then you would pass all of that to a word to wake algorithm, maybe let's say skip gram and post that you get dense representation for every node in that graph. The contribution of this paper essentially comes by adding a flexibility in terms of how do you explore the neighborhood and create those linear chains of graph. So there is a parameter that they define that kind of encourages to go more in depth in a certain network which gives a feel of how a DFS would work. Whereas you could also tweak that parameter to just search around in a certain neighborhood let's say one hop neighbors of it which gives a sense of breadth first search or level search. So after you play around with how do you want to sample these nodes using random walk, you come up with linear chains of all those nodes. Again, you pass it to word to wake algorithm and you get dense representation of every node in that graph. So this paper claims adding this flexibility of if you want to go in a breadth first or a depth first fashion is the key to learn rich representation compared to the previous approaches. We demonstrate the efficacy of node to wake over existing state of the art techniques on multi-level classification and link prediction on several real world networks in diverse domains. So this is how they test how good is a network's representation. They do a multi-level classification for every node in a graph. So this can be seen, let's say in social media network, you have every node as one of the users and the edges that you have kind of signify if they're friends or not. So you could do a multi-level classification for every node in terms of their interest maybe, or maybe if they belong to a certain community. So that could be one of the possible applications and talking about link prediction, link prediction is a task so you must have seen in Facebook network for example, the system would recommend you certain friends at certain point of time. So which is based on some common interest and common friends that two persons share. So that use case is essentially an example of link prediction where you have a system that takes two nodes as an input and predicts if there can be an edge link between them or not. Okay, so let's move forward. So this diagram shows how BFS and DFS search strategies would work for a node U. So consider you are a user and you are at node U at any point of your time during random walk. So all the red color arrow essentially tell that you are doing a breadth first search which means you are traversing more or less within the same community. Whereas if we see the blue colored arrow, you are essentially leaving out of the community and going somewhere in depth within the network structure. So there are two main properties that a network usually shows. The first is called the homophily. And the second one is called the structural symmetry. So if you see the depth first search essentially mimics the structural symmetry which means S6 is more or less similar to the node U because it has like four nodes attached to it at a one hop distance and similar is the case if you see the neighbors of S6. So more or less the structure is little preserved. 
So DFS lets you handle that kind of symmetrical features. Whereas if you see the homophily symmetries, so in this case, the representation for S1, S3 and S2 will be close to you in some n-dimensional representation space. So yeah, this way you can kind of trade off between the type of symmetry you would want your model to learn and encode in a feature vector format for every node. Okay. Now talking about the feature learning framework. So let's say we have graph G that has V vertices and E edges. And let's say our graph can be undirected or directed. It could be weighted or unweighted. We wish to find a function f that takes in a vertex v and represents it in a d-dimensional space. So d is the parameter specifying the number of dimensions of a feature representation. So these are the number of parameters that we wish to learn. So f is a matrix of v number of rows and d number of columns. So if d is equal to 100 and v is equal to let's say 200. So we have 200 vertices in that graph and each of the node is represented in 200 dimension. So 200 cross 100 are the number of parameters that we wish to learn. They also define NSU as subset of V where NSU is nothing but the neighborhood of node U under sampling strategy S that is some subset from entire set of nodes V. Then they wish to maximize the log probability of predicting the neighborhood of the node U given you have the feature representation for that node and you iterate it for all the number of nodes in that graph. So yeah, this is pretty clear because let's say if this is the graph that you have and this is the node U. So given some representation for this node, you want to maximize if this, this and this are the neighborhood for this node. So this is the probability that you wish to maximize. Okay. So to solve this log likelihood, we assume conditional independence where we factorize the likelihood into independent segments for every neighbor of the node U. So Ni is all the neighbors for node U under sampling strategy S. So what is the probability that you get neighbor N1? For example, if this was the representation for the central node, what is the probability that you get, let's say N2? So if this was the representation for the central node. So if the representation is good enough, you'll get this probability as high. So will the product. So that's how you calculate the log likelihood. Okay. So probability of observing Ni given the fu, which is the feature representation for the central node u, is given by the softmax function over the dot product of the neighbors. So you do a dot product of the neighbor and the central node to observe the similarity and normalize by all the nodes that you have in the network and considering its similarity with the central node u. So now if we plug all of this in the equation one, which was this equation of log likelihood, you can see we have a term log over there. So now if you take a log of this thing, you have log of a, minus log of b which is exactly what you can see is written over here the a comes at this position b comes at this position with the negative sign so this is the objective that you want to maximize okay given the linear nature of the text the notion of neighborhood can be naturally defined by a sliding window or consecutive words networks however are not linear thus a richer notation of the neighborhood is needed okay so what they're saying is in text a sentence could be represented as a linear chain of the words that propagates forward as you go in time and to get vector representation of this word let's say you can define a sliding window that has four words in it and the representation for this word depends on what are the words that occur in that context so under skipgram given this word you want to predict what are the nearby words that occur to be in that window so that is how you do in context to natural language but networks are not linear in nature so you need some mechanism to kind of convert that non-linear structure that might have hierarchy as well into some linear format of this sort. That is where the sampling strategies come into the picture. And how you do it again defines the richness of the representation that you are trying to learn. Which again what we saw as in the case of DFS and BFS in terms of homophily and structural symmetry. Okay, moving forward. Okay, so as we discussed, there's a bias term, what they define for controlling the random walks. They call it as search bias alpha. So they define a second order random walk with two parameters P and Q, which guide the walk. So second order random walk, which means at any instant T, you'll also consider the previous state where you have come from. So pi Vx is the final transition probability what they define. If you're going from node V to node X, it's a multiplication of Wvx which is the initial probability for that edge between the vertex V and X. Now this is the tweakable parameter, which is defined under these three conditions. So let's see the figure number two first. 
let's say your node started from point T, then after one hop, now you are at point V. So this is your current location of your random walker object. So they define alpha between the vertex V and any of the possibilities from where you can go from V to any of the Xi's. So which means if you are at V, T also become one of the Xi's is equal to one by Q if the shortest distance between the origin node, which was t, to any of the xi's is equal to 2, then you put the edge weight as 1 by q. So if you go from t to x1, the distance is 1, so that doesn't meet a criteria. From t to x2, you have a distance of 2, that's why you have this alpha is equal to 1 by q over here. And similarly from t to x3, you have a distance of 2, so again you have an alpha of 1 by q over here. So this is the factor that you multiply with the weight that was initialized between each of these edges and finally you have the pi with which you traverse from v to xi's. So this is when you have a distance of 2. Similarly if you have a distance of t to any of the xi's as 1 then alpha is equal to 1 which is the case from t to x1 if you see the distance is 1. That's why the alpha is also defined as 1 between v and x1. The last condition is if t to xi is equal to 0 then they define alpha is equal to 1 by p. So as I already mentioned, t is also one of the xi's if you are at v. So distance is equal to 0 which means from t to t itself the distance is 0. That's why the alpha between v and t is put as 1 by p. So exactly this is all what they have mentioned over here. Okay. So talking about p and q over here and giving a bit of an intuition around it. So we see if p is greater than max of either one which is the edge weight from v to x1 or q which is the edge weight from v to x2 and x3 then the overall alpha value for the edge weight from v to t will be very less compared to other edges so the chances of going back from v to t will be really low which means you are kind of promoting a depth first exploration rather than visiting the revisited nodes and similarly for q if it is less than the minimum of maybe 1 and p then the edge weights between v and x2 and v and x3 will be relatively more. So again, you'll be promoting a depth first exploration. So yeah, that is the basic intuition to how do you select p and q. So finally, talking about the entire algorithm, you have a graph g that has v vertices, e edges, and some initial weights w for each of the edges. d is the dimension, r is the number of walks per node, l is the walk length, k is the context size, p is the return parameter which we just saw, and q is the in out parameter. So you set the value of p and q and you get a distribution of pi over all the edges that you have in the graph. By modifying the initial priors that you had for the edge weights, you construct a graph g dash with that and you initialize all the walks to be in an empty list. And let's say we define we want to go r number of walks per node. So you do an iteration over that. Then for every node in the vertex that you had, you do a node to vec walk. You generate a random walk and append all of those walks to the list that you had created earlier. So after you are done with generating r number of random walks from every node in that graph, you do the back propagation to adjust the feature representation of every node. So now this function talks about how you sample the random walks. So this was one of the input that comes to this method, which is the entire graph. Then the starting node where you will start the random walk and the length of the walk that you want to traverse. So you start your random walk with this initial node in an empty list. You insert just the starting node. You iterate from 1 to L. You choose the last node in that array to be the current node. You get the neighbors of that. So V cur essentially holds all the neighbors to the current node. You sample a node from there based on the pi probability distribution that we have got, which is nothing but a function of P and Q parameters multiplied by the initial weight distribution. And then at last you append that node to the walk list. And finally you return that walk. So yeah, this is the entire pseudo algorithm to how node to work algorithm works. So I guess now we are done with the paper. We have experiments and all. So yeah, if you like such content and appreciate what I do, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Also do share it across with your friends, whosoever is interested in such content. I'll meet you in the next one. Bye.